I'd like to introduce, well, I'm actually going to introduce our moderator, but this is a ne negotiation strategy panel. And um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about our moderator, Nancy Ridge. And I actually found Nancy on YouTube. She was in a, <laughs> I, was, I, I was looking for someone who could do a, a session for women on um, mentorship. And there is a video of Nancy um, just talking about mentorship. And, and Nancy does a lot of, of coaching and teaching on mentorship. And, and so I got in touch with her. And she came and spoke to a brunch that we did at UCLA for our UCLA ICE Associates group. And she really drove it home concerning mentorship. And, and when we talked with the leadership, going back to the leadership panel, um, it's so important to find mentors and sponsors and and sometimes those people are not they may be younger than you they may be older than you they may be male they may be female but it's so important to, to have someone to support you and to mentor you and to run things past you know keep you from doing something really stupid so it's really that's really important so with Nancy one of the things I learned about Nancy too and why it, she's important too the conference is because um, Nancy founded a group called Women in the Channel, and she founded it because with a, a her co-founder was a competitor, and they decided that instead of competing against one another, they were going to work with one another and help one another and build up this community. Um, they have similar, they had similar clients, etc., but they were able to find something that they can. Um, have in common to be able to lift one another up. So um, besides Nancy, besides that, um, Nancy is also, she has 20 years of experience in telecommunications. She's a vice president of telecom brokers. And she her passion is delivering the best solutions in terms of technology, costs, contract flexibility, and quality to her customers. Nancy negotiates every day of her life. So she's the perfect person to lead this, this panel. And she's going to introduce the panelists. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much for being up. Oh, it's hard to, it's hard to set. I want to stand. I'm sure on. Yes. There we go. Thank you so much, Davida. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight and to participate in this really important discussion. We're with such a distinguished panel here tonight, and I'm excited to introduce them. I'm going to start off with Cindy Torzi. Cindy is the Director of Core Vehicle Management and Trusted Processing at Northrop Grumman Aerospace. And I did a little bit of research on each one of them, and I'll share a, a little bit. We do want to jump into this topic because this panel, by the way, is just a a group of master negotiators with really excellent information to share. So Cindy is responsible for the management, development, and delivery of common VMS and trusted processing products in multiple programs. She also works with business development to identify, capture, and in integrate into programs similar critical enhancements and capabilities. And that speaks to me very much, those duties of someone who must collaborate and negotiate with many different factions within an organization. It's also, I think, important to note that Cindy is a Bruin and comes from a Bruin family. Her daughter is sitting over here and about to take an exam tomorrow. So it's all in the family. We also are really excited to have Felice Balmancourt here as well. And Felice is the Vice President of TV Production and Technology at NBC Universal. She oversees the technology strategy and solution delivery for the country's largest and most successful production companies. She's received Emmy recognition for her industry leading solutions with SNL and also has been responsible for a myriad of breakthroughs in the area of production. And in that very complex world, it's really a great skill to have to be able to negotiate with so many different teams. So welcome. We're glad you're here. We also, excited to introduce Caitlin Greminger. Um, Caitlin 
is a special agent and hostage negotiator for the FBI. Now, <laughs> she has a background in electrical engineering, so she is a tech girl like the rest of us, but she has been a special agent since 2006. She's been a crisis negotiator since 2008, where she's been deployed to numerous crisis situations and kidnappings, including assisting with the kidnapping in Manila. Since May of 2017, she's been the Counterintelligence Strategic Partnership Coordinator here in Los Angeles, and she focuses on cyber threats, insider threats, and security concerns. So I think Caitlin will give us a whole other perspective on negotiating tonight. <laughs> And I'm also really excited to have our gentleman on the panel tonight. Uh, Miguel Ansueta is the associate professor here at UCLA, Anderson School of Business Management. He's in the organizational behavior group. And he specializes in diversity, bias, and discrimination. His research explores how people understand their position within social hierarchies and the impact of this understanding on self and in groups. He's an, he is a published author with many uh, awards, as I've discovered, and teaches managerial psychology and negotiating here at UCLA. And I'm just really thrilled to have these people here at Thank you. Now, our goal, as was mentioned earlier, is to leave you with some practical how-tos. And ladies, I know that we especially like how-tos. Um, <laughs> and of course, the first and most important one is how to become a more effective negotiator for yourself in your own career in the workplace. But we're also going to address the importance of negotiating in leadership how, as a leader, we can take those negotiating skills to another level for a different purpose. Really, these are skills that are critical to demonstrate leadership and also to create change within our organizations. I saw that in our demographics tonight, we have a number of leaders here in the audience already. So uh, I think this aspect of negotiating as a leader is a really important one. And of course, we'll discuss the barriers that we face as women to accomplish these goals. In her book, Women Don't Ask, Linda Babcock joined many others who've addressed this really important topic. And she found a 7.6% salary gap between male and female MBAs. She asked them, did you negotiate? And sadly, just 7% of the women attempted to negotiate, whereas 57% of the men did. Now, that 7.6% difference in salary became a huge and significant loss of income for these women over the course of their careers. And what's worse, the reality is that most of them were nev never able to overcome that gap in their income. So I just have to comment, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I, I believe that this whole uh, idea of asking for what we want and for what we're entitled to, I will admit that it's, it's a difficult thing to do. In fact, for myself, I can say that even with the accomplishments that I've had, thank you for the great introduction to Vita, and the many connections that I've made, a number of who are in this room, I still bump up against those barriers myself. And I know that many of you do too. Um, what I will say is that I'm learning. And I think that's what we can all do. I was recently offered an amazing opportunity to open the West Coast division for a company by a CEO that I greatly admire. And yet, when I spoke to him about what I required in terms of title, support, and compensation, through the course of the negotiations, we discovered that the funding wasn't there to support it. And I had to walk away from the opportunity. And I will say that it took all of my experience and skills at that point to not accept less than what I am worth 
and what the job required, even though I had this overwhelming desire to help the CEO. In 2015, KPMG did a very extensive study on female leadership, and they found that the greatest barriers to female leadership are confidence and connections. So I'd like to start off tonight by discussing those barriers first. So we're going to begin with Miguel. Miguel, what are some of the real and perceived barriers to negotiating for women? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, on this panel. It's, uh, I'm not a tech girl, but I'm a liberal arts boy. So <laughs> I, I commend you all for your inclusiveness. Um, yeah, so uh, before I answer your question, just really quickly on that Linda Babcock stat where it was 57% of male MBAs negotiated their initial job offer and only 7% of women, that's what happened when there was no actual training in place um, or any explicit norms around the fact that you needed to negotiate your, your initial salary. So Linda Babcock actually created a core negotiations class that every MBA at Carnegie Mellon was asked to take. And I think four years later, that gap was completely eliminated within Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I would, argue, I would say that that is one of the first barriers that I think women face in, in negotiation. When I teach negotiation, I have a lot of students, and in particular women, assuming that negotiation skills are something you either have or you don't. And that's simply not the case. Mm -hmm. um, Negotiation skills are trainable. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And the actual frameworks around negotiation are not particularly complicated. That's why it's very teachable, and that's why classes on negotiations do have these dramatic impacts, like the elimination of this negotiation gap at Carnegie Mellon. That's great. So, Cindy, I understand that you actually have a story about a negotiation that you were involved in that at first seemed unsuccessful, but ultimately led to a number of breakthroughs. Can you share with us? So um, I'm, I'm an engineer. I have a bachelor's and a master's from UCLA in engineering. And I've worked in aerospace my whole career. Um, and it's a, it's a very male-dominated field. Um, and I, I had a lot of really interesting opportunities over the years. And I actually got to the point where I had made it into the bonus incentive program associated with, with Northrop Grumman. At the time, it was TRW, um, and they later were acquired by Northrop Grumman. And, and I went into a, a new assignment where I was really um, demonstrating success in turning around a troubled organization. And coming out of, well, while I was in the middle of that, I, I started receiving incentives on top of that. And I thought, hooray, I made it. I, I broke through this, and, and my career's really going to break out here. And what happened shortly after that was um, I, the incentives just stopped. I was still on the bonus program, but the incentives stopped. And I was just puzzled. I didn't understand what had happened where I, I couldn't continue on this upward trajectory. So I tried negotiating with my management, saying, you know, look, my responsibility's going up. I'm still having the same kind of performance numbers. And that, you know, I really need to, you know, get on a path where I can get promoted from where I am now so that I can move on from there. And it became obvious after, you know, longer time than it should have is unless I took action, it wasn't going to change. And, and I had actually recently read a book that I'll give a plug called The um, Happiness Advantage, all right? And, and what was really interesting about, about this book, and then it kind of inspired me, inspired me, was that you, know, you, could, you could approach your career in a way that satisfied you as a personal level satisfied the people around you and it enabled you to actually be more successful mm. okay and so i said okay after reading this book i'm i'm going to take charge of this and i'm going to do something different and so what i did is i went out and i applied for a job that was a promotion but in addition to applying for this job um, i reached out to people that i knew that um, would be able to counsel me about what was needed in this job and i wrote a detailed cover letter associated with the posting associated with the job as far as what my background was and how I was ideal for this job based on my background. And then I just started setting up meetings with people and talking to people. 
And what I found in the course of these conversations is the things that I worked on were so successful that I had become invisible. <laughs> okay, and I was just <laughs> off the radar screen. Okay, and and then um, and and I would talk to the folks that I reached out to. They would give me other people to talk to. And in the course of these conversations, they would say, "I forgot you did all of these things." Okay, and then they gave me other people to talk to, and so I wound up talking to about seven people over the course of this this activity that I kicked off for myself in terms of trying to take responsibility for my career. And eventually, um, I started talking to the vice president that was in charge of this particular role, and, and that particular vice president shared with me at that point that I was probably not going to get that job, that they had made a decision that they were going to do something else. And that was a very deflating experience at the time, but during the course of that conversation, um, with this particular vice president, you know, I made I made a remark that you know I can't believe that someone with my track record has been a director one for ten years, and and, and he just stopped, right? And he couldn't he didn't have an answer to that because I worked I actually worked on his program, okay? So he knew that I had turned around all of these activities, um, but I was very deflated after that, and, and I kind of went off and did did some other things, and, and I, I basically engaged on my retirement plan. <laughs> this, this is what I started doing, I was, I was sort of fed up. But what happened later was I got pulled out of a meeting um, and said, you, you need to go talk to, to this particular vice president. And what had happened is there had been some new work that had come in, and they made a decision to direct place me on that new work when it came in. They didn't compete it, they just direct placed me into it. And it was because because I had done that homework before, I got back onto people's radar screens, they realized what capabilities I did have, and, and I was put directly into the spot. Um, it was a little bit of a risk for me because it was, a, it was a very different job, and it also was not a promotion, all right, which is what I was lobbying for. But what happened was I wound up getting promoted a couple of, couple of months later. So, um, and what I realized out of that experience is that you always have to be your own advocate, <laughs> all right? Um, become invisible. And so that was really, and that's something I really wish I'd figured out much earlier. Like, I believe that yeah. we're calling that claiming your impact, yeah. right, yeah. tonight. So that's amazing. And, and it takes, you know, there's a little bit of um, sponsorship in there too. Mm -hmm. You know, engaging those individuals to sponsor you. And it's so important, I think, to engage others. Which leads me, Felice, to you. Um, you're a leader. You have multiple teams that you work with. And as a professional in that area, how do your negotiating skills, uh, how do you use them for the teams as well as yourself, the people that you manage? Sure. Um... So, um, uh, as uh, we mentioned, I'm in um, technology leadership uh, role for a production um, area within NBC Entertainment. Um, I mean, I guess I learned throughout my 20 years career as well certain tricks, and I certainly, you know, constantly try to uh, read and, and Google and every kinds of ways um, try and continue to learn. As you said, right, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, and I think you need to accept that. And I realize we have students in the room as well. I think one of um, the techniques or the ways that I learn is um, is that um, you know to first of all create opportunities. I guess that's number one. If there is no opportunity, there is nothing to negotiate, right? Um, and how do you basically seize an opportunity? How do you identify? identify an opportunity, whether it's basically career related or education related or at home, family oriented. Um, for me, there's this pulse test. Okay, if it's if it's going to enable me to, to grow and learn, uh, if it's going to uh, let me uh, kind of uh, expose to people and uh, create network, and if it's going to create more opportunities for me, it's a yes, it's an opportunity for me. Now it's basically, let's basically explore that opportunity, right? Um, second sort of 
trick, I guess, or, uh, or, or tip that I, I, I would um, kind of advise, I guess, it's, it's believing your power, right? So in every opportunity, um, if you're in the room, whether you're interviewing for a position that you're interested, or um, you're basically in a room with CIOs, executives, or whatever that room that you aspire to be in. If you're in the room, you have the power. Right. Don't question it. Yes. Right. Yeah. You're in the room because, for a reason. Yeah. Um, majority of the time, I mean, sometimes, again, it's a learning process, even in the rooms that I aspire to be in, right? I, I find myself questioning. There's this you know, sound in my head, like, okay, uh, you know, do you have something lacking, or do you have, I, it's kind of questioning constantly, be aware of, of that voice, mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, I think, you know, you deserve to be there, you have the power, believe in that, and that creates the confidence that you were talking about, I think, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a saying, of course, that everybody's familiar with, you know, um, fake it until, you know, you believe it. Um, <laughs> Uh, unless you believe it, nobody's going to believe it. Um, so I think, you know, I believe in that as well. So when it comes to, you know, my day-to-day -day at work, uh, how I use it for myself, um, I'm about to transition into the new role. I've been with NBC Universal about 12 years. Um, I've done film technology, I've done TV technology because I raised hand, because I said, hey, I want to continue to learn and I love the company. Indeed, you know, I work in a um, really, really good company where um, even sort of like I, I lead tech women uh, among many, you know, courageous and creative women, um, as well as I'm part of some of the diversity initiatives within the company. So I consider myself really lucky to be at a company like NBC University to begin with. But of course, that doesn't mean that done is done. We need to work together and uh, collaborate together to, to move the flag. So I believe in in playing a big role as as um, as myself, as my team, as well as the 300 people in this room. Um, so from that, you know, vantage point, um, as I mentioned, I'm in the process of moving into a totally different role. Um, and I do believe that, you know, to create those types of opportunities, going back to the opportunity and, and negotiation, you need to be willing to take risks. So I think mm -hmm. that's the other aspect that I will just kind of uh, mm -hmm. leave a note. Um, I think I've always created opportunities for myself where, hey, let's negotiate. Yes, I mean, I'm, you know, my needs are this, and the other party is, is you know, kind of needing this. These are the needs, these are the wants, right? Where can I meet that? And being able to create those opportunities where we win situation occurs. And I'm always aware of sort of like where is that point where uh, I'm not going to take it anymore and be strong about like, hey, this is it. Like, you have a stand mm -hmm. and you're not going to give in at that point. Well, you are in the room as a leader because you're a leader and because of your experience. And, you know, I believe that you set that example as well for all those women that you mentioned that you're leading. So, you know, I find that oftentimes, you know, we have a responsibility as leaders and frankly women tend to do better in their negotiations when they're negotiating for others rather than negotiating for ourselves so at times you know that that uh, those skills come out stronger as leaders um, Caitlin um, you know you're presented with opportunities that obviously are there <laughs> they exist or you aren't in the room in a sure. crisis negotiation tell us what is your opening strategy and and what do you do the first time they reject you? Well, let me just start with saying they always reject us to start off with. <laughs> I have had people hang up the phone on me so many times. It's, I would have a complex if I hadn't been trained to expect it. Um, I think, honestly, being comfortable with that failure, and let me be very clear, I'm never comfortable with that failure, but I accept that that's part of it. I also have to thank Felice for the pep talk. I'm sitting up here thinking I'm experiencing the imposter syndrome of what am I doing sitting with these amazing people? So just know what happens to all of us. <laughs> um, but to be honest, our, for crisis negotiation, it genuinely translates to every day. Our opening strategy, how we begin, is listening. Mm. Our core tenant of crisis negotiation is active listening skills. We 
feel that people can't get past their crisis. It may be a business negotiation where they're dug in and in crisis, or it could be they have a hostage, either one. Skill set is the same. To be honest, it, it's, it, it's really like they, until they vent their crisis and share their needs, they are not interested in hearing what you have to say. So until we get to, until I understand why they're at the table, why they're in the room, why they're in the room with a hostage, or why they're at the table resisting uh, you know, some kind of a business dealing, until I understand what they're looking for, we are not having a conversation because inside their head they're basically screaming what they need, what they need, what they need. And until they feel heard, until I validate that I've taken the time to hear them, we're not moving past that. And mm -hmm. we have to be careful because we come to the table with the same issue, right? Like I'm going to talk to someone who's holding a hostage. My, my need is to get everyone out safe. But I have the ability of knowing that that won't happen until I hear them. So I have to keep emotionally neutral. I, I put them first. I hear them out. And then from that conversation, once we've built a rapport, or once I've shown them, that I, I care about what they want, then we have a conversation we come to. And often, I don't have to tell them what I want. I can carefully walk them down that path by just letting them get themselves there, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, the talking this much for me is not actually common. I'm accustomed to listening. Right, right. So are you asking questions or um, yes. typically? Yes. So. Uh, we, we actually use a little mnemonic, um, more pies, because who doesn't want more pie? Um, and it's, it's, literally, it's literally eight active listening skills, and it's minimal encouragers, open-ended, you can talk to me afterwards if you actually want these, minimal encouragers, open-ended questions, reflecting, mirroring, emotion labeling, um, paraphrasing, I message, I'm panicking that I'm going to forget one of these, by the way, effective pause and summary. And that. these are all just very, they're, they're, you do these every single day already. We just teach them in a way that is intentional. Mm. So you're already doing all of these. You don't even know. In fact, right now, all of you are doing these because you're looking at me. You're giving me uh, <laughs> minimal encouragers, eye contact. You're already doing these. You're already experts at these. You just don't know it yet. So don't worry. You're already there. <laughs> you too can be a crisis negotiator. Miguel, um, how does conditioning affect our willingness to negotiate? And how does that affect negotiations? Yeah, so there's a, a very... It's kind of a depressing academic literature finding that um, men tend to negotiate more than women. There's no evidence that men are better at negotiating. There's just evidence that uh, men tend to engage in negotiations more. So um, you can ask men, for example, when the last time they negotiated, men say on average two weeks ago, women say four weeks ago. You ask them when they expect to negotiate again, men say probably next week. Women say in about a month. Um, you talked earlier about the stat. In, in, in negotiating uh, salary. Um, and where that comes from, um, I think there is a great deal of social conditioning that makes it very normative for men to simply ask for what they want. There's some sociological work that finds that uh, boys tend to be assigned more seasonal chores, which are more likely to be paid. So like, if you live in a place with snow, like shoveling uh, shoveling the driveway, something I've heard people do. I'm from Texas and California, so I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but that is a seasonal uh -huh. chore that's more likely to be paid. Uh, girls are more likely to get routine chores, like washing the dishes, stuff like that. And what the research finds is that seasonal hobbies are much more likely to be paid for than routine. And so therefore, boys start picking up early on that their time equals money. So that's just one example of where this socialization happens. But what about the um, the factor where you know little girls are are taught to be nice and yeah. polite? Yeah. You know that that we aren't supposed to rock the boat. Sure. You know, sort of thing. I mean, I, I see that that plays in, and and when we do, you know, oftentimes in negotiations, the woman who is asking directly for what yeah. she wants or seeks is perceived as being pushy or overly ambitious, as opposed to hearing the same thing from a guy would just be. Yeah hey, you know, no big deal. That's what I'd expect. Yeah, and there's definitely, I'm not saying this is fair, but there, there definitely are different hurdles that female negotiators have to navigate when trying to negotiate. One of them is this counter-stereotypic backlash of being labeled bossy versus being called uh, a, a leader, leader for, right. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I always emphasize in my class for, for students that are anxious about negotiating, it's really important to just be comfortable with your own negotiation style. 
figure out what that is by engaging in, in as much negotiation as you can and making a bunch of mistakes, but then figuring out what works. And also, it's really important to think mm -hmm. of negotiation. Making a bunch of mistakes yeah. and then figuring out what works. I just want to repeat that. Forever. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> failure is the only way to, to actually right. learn. And then the other thing, too, is um, it's really important to think of negotiation not as a conflict to be had, but rather as a puzzle to be solved. Because ah. ne negotiators need each other. The car right. salesman needs you to buy the car. Mm -hmm. Your boss needs you as an employee. Or if mm -hmm. you're the boss, you need the employee. People need each other if they're even there to negotiate. So it's on you to figure out a way to share enough information to figure out creative trade-offs to therefore solve the puzzle that leaves both parties better off. Absolutely. The win-win, so to speak. Exactly. So um, Davida mentioned how I have a passion for mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, Caitlin, what effect does that have on your negotiating strategies? Um, for us, I think about it as we, we never, ever, ever, ever negotiate alone, ever, never. When I am negotiating with someone on the phone, which is usually what we do, we're rarely face to face. It's on the phone, there's a crisis situation. I have, uh, we call it a coach, actually. They sit next to me and post-it notes are flying everywhere. Um, and, I'm not, and, and it's a variety of things. It's, it's providing me in information that's new to the negotiation. And I think if you listen to it, a lot of this translates to any negotiation you have. I'm getting new information about what's happening in the situation that doesn't necessarily have, um, is, isn't generated from our conversation. Um, they're providing me, they're just reminding me of the active listening skills because sometimes you get tunnel vision in the middle of a negotiation and you forget all of the words in the English language. <laughs> it's never happened. Um, but most importantly, I, they provide feedback. You're talking too quickly. You, you like, don't you know, use their name, like little tips like that, that feedback. And so for me, that means that when I'm negotiating not in a crisis situation on the phone, I seek out those people who I trust to be my coach and say, hey, here's the conversation I need to have. Here's the negotiation I need to have. Let's kind mm -hmm. of practice it. Mm -hmm. Give me feedback. Give, give me skills. So mm -hmm. I, it's integral. I do not negotiate alone, either in a crisis situation or in my career. And there's no reason why you know, those support people can't be used in business negotiations for you know active role playing i think that's a good strategy if you have a crucial conversation coming up you know to find a coach or a mentor or someone who can walk through it with you um, as we reach our, our five minute mark, and this has gone so fast, I, we wanted to cover a lot more ground. But one of the questions I'll just throw out there for anyone uh, who would like to answer is, how is the use of technology changing or impacting the way you negotiate? Who would like to take that one first? Go ahead. I mean, for, it, it makes a big difference. Um, we often say the number one, the negotiator's number one tool is your tone, and tone in technology is really difficult to achieve. It, 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 you have to be very careful on how you craft messages. Mm, you we, mean, yes, like emails yes, or texts or yes, correct. Yes, 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 exactly. Uh -huh. Not lacking the face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice communication can generally can change things. So having still having the coach to read things before you hit send is key. Uh, but for typos and for tone, you don't want to accidentally, in your haste to respond, mistake things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Anyone? for one thing, you can Google any salary and sort of yeah. like what you awesome. do, a research, knowing your value. Right. Uh, up front Last is door. important, I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, as well as um, sort of doing the research around, you know, let's say that's a for particular position, um, not necessarily budget or... or um, I guess speaking of budget, for if I can segue, if you're going for a salary negotiation, what I found is, you know, majority of the time, the the other party is going to top in their but because when you budget things, quote unquote, you will budget at the top, right? So that means that the other party is always, you know, going to have some room for you to, you know, kind of wiggle around. Mm -hmm. Knowing that is even itself is a power, I think. Um, when you're kind of going back and forth and knowing sort of like, um, again, um, through internet, uh, even the stats around, you know, okay, only 50%, you know, of the 57% uh, of the men uh, negotiates and only 7% doesn't negotiate could be a, a information point that you can use. Yep. Um, 
you know, things like that. What about looking, uh, using LinkedIn to get to know the person you're going to be negotiating with? Yeah, you, you always want to try to do a little reconnaissance work on the person mm -hmm. you're about to negotiate yeah. with. Uh, one thing I always advise my students is to uh, try to get a sense for what the negotiation style of the person they're about to engage mm -hmm. in is. And one way to do that is to try to talk to people who have maybe had contact with this person, try to get some insider information so you can get a sense for what issues are likely to be the ones where there's movement on. Uh, and also you get a sense for what this person is going to be like once you're actually sitting down mm -hmm. to negotiate with them. And Cindy, I noticed you have uh, Crucial Conversations in your lap, which is one of my favorite books. And they, they talk about there, you know, you can expound more for us, you know, about that mutual agreement and so so there's been a lot of there's been a lot of allusions to strategies for negotiations through all of the discussions so far right and and it's very hard to kind of just take the fast enough notes in a way to to really be able to use it so what i found is that this is a very the book is is kind of dry but it has a lot of real tangible how to's in it okay and and you know, if, if you take a look at this and say, oh, I could try this, right? Just pick a couple of things to try, right? It can really help you make progress. Now, one thing that they talk about in here that we haven't really talked about is creating safety in the negotiations. Yes. And, and what happens is, is if you get into a point in any negotiation where someone's feeling threatened, okay, you're, you're not going to make progress in your negotiation. So, and, and we can inadvertently make someone not feel safe, all right? And, and we can also um, recognize when we're personally not feeling safe, right? And, and there's strategies for kind of disengaging from that emotion, right? Okay. And, and trying to reset and then and move forward in kind of a more calm manner. So, you know, in terms of having tools in, the, in your toolbox, you know, I think that this is, is really useful. I love so. it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? We have one minute. Okay, super. Great. Um, well, <laughs> um, I wanted to also just kind of circle back for a second, um, uh, Felice, with you, because you had shared with me there was a super tough negotiation you had gone through one time. And you said, you know, I'd really like to share a little bit about that. So. I don't know if you can cover it in a minute, but we'll give um, it a shot. Yeah, it was, I mean, <clears throat> between the F FBI negotiator and the rocket scientist, <laughs> if this is relevant. <laughs> but just uh, in terms of, um, you know, it, it was a negotiation. It's, it's recent, so I'm not going to get into very details, but um, when a negotiation is sort of impacting your family or your team, it's kind of, the, the importance of that negotiation and what kind of role you play uh, sort of suddenly elevates, right? Yes. Um, so this most recent uh, piece was more of like, as I'm moving on to a new role, you know, kind of determining determining um, where my team, what, what's going to happen with my team. <laughs> um, of course, you know, when you're in a role, a particular role, um, and especially in this case, it was a role that I sort of built from scratch to and elevated to a level that I was very proud of. So they're like your babies. It's kind of like your baby, <laughs> definitely. Um, but when you're sort of leaving that situation, right, the question becomes, okay, you know, various scenarios that is going to happen with that situation. And I was also in the process of promoting, you know, a few of my um, direct reports. Um, and you all almost like, okay, so if I leave this position, there's going to be a bunch of, you know, uh, impact to, to the individual members that I care about, yeah. as well as some of the baby ideas that I uh, sort of instilled that I, you want to see sort of grow in, in, in including solving business problems. Um, so I, I found myself negotiating, basically, navigating. I guess one of the other kind of um, takeaways that I want to give is I feel like negotiation, it's almost like a process, right? There is this aspect of creating and networking and, and people around you is really, really important. So there's this one, you know, the network that you get information from and the other network is your support sort of coalition. 
And that support coalition plays a really, really important role in you influencing certain decisions, even when you're kind of on the way out, <laughs> say. So I think, um, so in this tough negotiation that I'm part of is, again, I think at the end of the day, my um, uh, interest here is company's interest, people's interest. If I didn't believe in, I wouldn't even, you know, kind of fight for that negotiation. But I guess some of the, you know, um, the outcomes that I'm super proud and happy for is, okay, I looked at, you know, certainly, you know, what, who's the new lead? Uh, can I sit down and kind of figure out their, their interests and how I, how I can influence that? Um, and then working with your peers and kind of understanding their interests and how you can contribute to their um, sort of story, but really building a story and journey. And, I'll, you know, what makes uh, sense to sort of satisfy all those needs, but also like, you know, kind of, justify your own story. Yeah, and ask at the end of the day. I right. think that is, you know, the, the biggest thing is that we need to be able to speak up and articulate, you know, where is the benefit for all. For sure. And um, I know that we wanted to get a few questions. We have such a, a great group here. So if you have a question, please come to the mic. There's one over here. There's one over here. <laughs> okay, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. So internally, we have different levels, like mid-level and then like a higher mid-level into senior. Then you have like a middle senior level and a higher senior level. How do you negotiate um, the salary when you don't know and you can't research or Google what like a mid-level or a higher mid-level should make? Did you want to go <laughs> yeah. in particular? Reach out, reach out to other people in the company, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and get advice from other people in the company, right? Um, I mean, you'll, you'll have some sense of who's approachable, and, and when you approach someone, ask them for other people to talk to. Okay. okay? And most, my experience is they'll share it with you. Even, even if they don't publish it, you can get insight into that by, by trying to make personal contacts that way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Even if it's not your company, I would say you want to find a comparable company and maybe try to figure out if they have any kind of data or metrics. But you definitely need something to go on, and there has to be something out there. Even if it isn't perfect data, you need something to hang your head on. Which I'll just say that's one of the reasons it's good to be a part of an organization like, you know, women in technology or, yeah. you know, we have all these various groups here tonight that we're representing because you'll meet people who will come from those, those different groups. You'll get good sources that way. I guess I would also even, you know, let's say that you asked around in your trust circles and networks like this, I would definitely go to HR. What is the range? You may not get an answer. The worst case scenario, they'll tell mm -hmm. you that, hey, we can't give you an answer. And you would ask, who should I go? Who would yeah. be the resource, right? You'll get an answer. Mm -hmm. yes. A comment and a sort of a question. The first comment is a lot of things we're talking about, it's negotiations happen all the time, not just for salary. Um, and I'm noticing that a lot uh, in an acquisition we're going through and negotiating, are we going to do what you do or what we do? And, you know, keep keep what's really important to you, and give up, give away the rest, and it makes them happy. But you get what's important. Um, and then, as far as the salary negotiation, you mentioned it earlier, but I think it's really important to distinguish between when you're going in as a new employee, because you're talking to HR at that point, versus when you're trying to get bumped up after you're in the company, and then you're talking to your supervisor. Um, and there are two different kinds of negotiations, really, and that bit, that entry is really critical. Like, and somebody said this, that if you don't come in at a high enough level, you're never going to make up right. the difference. Right. That's right. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. So thank you for being here. This talk has been very interesting, for sure. I've always been interested in negotiation. My question is, as an undergraduate right now, looking for an entry-level um, 
in, in a few months, basically. I was just wondering, should negotiation for an entry level be there, given that I have little experience outside of my little uh, of outside of my few internships. What is your intake on that? Because of course, um, I'm facing the situation where there is a very competitive position and there are a lot of people competing for this position. Would it set me up um, negatively to like try to no negotiate for a salary with little experience? Um, if I can actually jump in on this real quick, I am part of that statistic. I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering as did one of my peers. We were hired by the same company he got $7,000 more per year than I did. I assume he negotiated. I never asked. I didn't. I just took whatever they offered. Negotiate. <laughs> I hired an intern this summer, and she asked for more money than I offered, and I gave it to her. So. <laughs> The words they're going to say is no, or they're going to, you know, it, it's a conversation. It's not an end point. Uh, I, I would just say make sure you have the job offer in hand uh, before you start the negotiation process. <laughs> uh, don't start throwing out, you know, numbers before an offer is actually made. Uh, and then to the extent possible, if you can do any kind of research and get some objective standard for what salary rate seems fair, you want to make your ask based on something objective. So based on my own research and the market value, this is the salary that I think I should get once the offer's in hand. So, so yes, you should totally negotiate. So when I was an undergrad, which was a very long time ago, um, there was a career guidance center, and you could go to the people in the career guidance center, and they could help you get that kind of information mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it applies in many roles, and mm -hmm. that's the, another way to figure out, you know, your sort of competitiveness as well as you know salary and other benefits. Thank you. Do we have time? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this question is for the professor or any of you that have experience or research. Um, I actually am in marketing and had an HR business partner that uh, I was talking to about some upward mobility. And he had an interesting uh, or tactic or a stat where he said half the time, he spends talking to women about applying for positions where they might not have exactly every single skill for versus men who apply for the job because they're confident. So women tend to have a tendency to think they need to check off the boxes of every single thing and men just have the confidence to say, hey, I could do this. I've done a quarter of it and I could do it. So, and, and so I'm wondering, you know, that was just our company experience and something yeah, yeah. our HR business partner observed. Do you have actually any research or yeah, yeah, data yeah. that shows that women, you know, if you go for the job and you don't have all the experience that you can do it, obviously? Yeah, th there's, um, like I said, there's a very depressing literature on these gender differences in, in negotiations. Um, yeah, th that is, that is a, a tendency that uh, men, for example, tend to internally derive what they're worth, women are much more likely to wait and see what the market tells them they're worth. So it's a much more reactive um, sort of valuation for the self. Um, I think it's incredibly important to realize that nobody's ever actually ready for any real promotion. Um, that's certainly been my experience. That's been my experience in seeing all my colleagues around me get promoted. No one's ever 100% ready. Um, and to the extent that people are nominating themselves, they're probably going to end up getting more and more. So that's the phenomenon for sure. And, and you're right about the gender gap. What, what I would say is incredibly important on the management side of things. If management is passive and reactive and only giving things to people that ask, you're not doing your jobs as managers. You're supposed to be mining the store. And if you are noticing that only marginally qualified men are asking for things and you're giving it to them, <laughs> you're a bad manager. <laughs> so. I think the, the responsibility is on both sides. I think it is on female employees to make sure that they are putting themselves in positions for success and promotion, but it's also on management to ensure that you're just not giving out resources to those who ask. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be monitoring merit and mm -hmm. rewarding people commensurately. So I think the, the fix is on both sides. That's great. Okay, just take one more question. Hi, um, my question I guess is about when do you come to that point of owning 
who you are and what you have to offer. And coming into, I guess, a negotiation at that point of strength, I caught a guest today on a program, Judge Judy Shilin, and I guess this story has become part of American lore, but she talked about how she went into, um, I guess it was a salary discussion, and she came into the, with an envelope, and the producer, production, whoever, they had an envelope. She came in and passed her envelope, and he said, don't you want to see my envelope? Don't you want to see what you're going to offer? Because it could be more than what you have on the envelope. And she said, if I look at your envelope, it becomes a negotiation. When does it come to a point where it's not a negotiation anymore? She just owned what, this is what I have to offer, this is what I have to bring, and these are my terms, and this is what I'd like. So where do you come to that place of strength? I think it's a constant journey. I mean, for me, it's a constant, it's a constant journey to believe, it. I mean, I, on paper, I look at my description of my career, my accomplishments, and I think, wow, who's that person? Um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm constantly struggling with confidence, 100%, uh, whether I'm on the phone negotiating or sitting in front of all of you. Um, but I find that in situations where I'm sincere with myself and who I am, like I, if I try to negotiate like someone else, it's awful and it feels terrible. If I try to do anything because I saw someone else do it and I want to be like them, it doesn't connect with me. It's when I'm sincere to who I am as a person, uh, my personality and what works for me. And as you've kind of seen, what works for me is kind of being silly and goofy and owning that's who I am. Um, that also makes me feel more confident, but it's a constant journey. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panel. We really appreciate all that excellent advice. Um, we're going to reset again, so please have conversations at your table. Thank you. I'll be reset. Um, and by the way, this is these are the recommended books. If you want to take a screenshot of uh, of what this panel has put together. And if Miguel's stats are right, and maybe my male coworker is going to negotiate in two weeks, so maybe I need to go and negotiate in about a week. <laughs> I need to be prepared. And so, and if, and as Leah said, if my boss, who is Jim, who was here before, rolls his eyes, I can ask him, is there is anything wrong? You, you rolled your eyes at me. It's,